without further ado, uh, we will get into uh, today's author talk. So, um, Adriana Chartrand is a mixed race Native woman, born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her father is Red River Metis, born and raised in the Metis community of St. Lawrence, and her mother is a white settler from Manitoba. Adriana has two degrees in film studies and has previously worked in the social work field. And Ordinary Violence is her debut novel, a chilling horror story about a young Indigenous woman haunted by the oppressive legacies of colonization. She lives in Toronto and works in the film industry. So welcome. We're Thank so you. happy to have you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so hopefully, um, we're interested that in you have a reading for us from your, your yes, book. Yes, you are ready to sure. talk for us. Yeah, we can dive right in. Uh, so I'm going to read a bit of the start of Chapter 5. Dawn can't remember the last time there were this many people in the house, and there are only four of them, shuffling awkwardly to claim space in the cramped kitchen. Dawn stands next to the fridge, with a clear sight line to the front door, and Crystal and Mrs. Cleary stand in front of the sink, Crystal clasping and unclasping her hands in front of her. Mrs. Cleary had appeared at the door with a giant cheese and broccoli casserole a few days after Dawn had inadvertently paid them a visit, and Martin had told her about Cody. Won't it be nice for him to see some familiar faces? Crystal and I can help form the welcoming committee, she declared. Any minute now, Dawn will witness her brother, a free man, walk through the front door. She hopes that they will embrace, that he won't hold her absence from the visiting room for seven years against her, that this freedom will be enough. When the front door opens after an eternity of waiting, it is not her brother who walks through it. This man is tall and broad and dirty blonde, wearing an old cracked leather vest. He looks like a biker, rough and mean but smiling. Rather, he's projecting a smile, like he wants everyone to believe he's friendly and relaxed. Dawn feels a jolt like an electric shock in her brain, like her nervous system producing a warning. But before she has time to decide what's behind the stranger's smile, Cody appears. He clasps a hand on the bigger man's shoulder and shuffles awkwardly past him in the narrow entryway. Cody strides into the kitchen, arms spread wide like he's blessing everyone. Then he wraps him tightly around himself, hugs himself, and begins to cry softly. It's not the greeting that anyone expected. That's clear from the blank, slightly horrified looks on everyone's faces. Dawn has never seen Cody cry. The biker appears beside Cody and envelops him in his muscled arms. Finally, unable to tolerate the sound of Cody quietly weeping any longer, Dawn says, Cody, are you okay? She is keenly aware that this is the weakest possible response, but she has nothing else to offer. She has the disorienting feeling she's seen this before, that cold creep of certainty that something bad is about to happen, like she knows how this part ends. A few rattling, shaky breaths later, Cody gathers himself and raises his head, gently pushes the other man's arms away. He crosses to Dawn in two quick strides and hugs her. Smells sweat, cigarettes, some kind of cheap, strong deodorant, and under it all something else she can't identify during the few seconds her brother holds her tightly to him. Cody pulls away, looks at Dawn, and smiles almost shyly. His eyes are dry and clear, like he hasn't been crying at all. Dawn, I can't, you can't know how good this feels, holy fuck. He shakes his head in disbelief. Mrs. Cleary and Crystal both react subtly to Cody. His presence always registers in a room. He's had the same alternately compelling and repelling energy since high school. Cody's eyes flick toward Crystal and Mrs. Cleary, still standing awkwardly in front of the sink, their smiles now determinedly fixed. Crystal, right? He says, looking up at her on a very slight, almost imperceptible angle, his dark lashes emphasized and brown eyes gone soft and inviting. That's the other thing about her brother. He's always been a dog. Yes, Crystal almost yelps. She's so eager to break her and her mother's silence. Cody, it's so good to see you. She finishes pretty flat, but Don can't blame her. Sorry, Cody says, contrite and polite, yet with that rangy hang to his limbs that is somehow evocative of a prison yard. I can't remember your name, ma'am. He flashes a grin at Mrs. Cleary. That's all right, dear. It's Elena, Mrs. Cleary. So glad to see you again. She smiles and quickly nods her head a few times. The stranger has yet to be introduced. Oh, right. Well, thanks for coming, Crystal and Mrs. Cleary. I was thinking we could all go out for supper like for steaks or something like that. I've been eating some pretty shit food the last little while. Cody gives a hearty laugh like what he said was actually funny, and before anyone can respond, the biker steps forward. Hello, everyone. My name's Tyler. He starts like he's at an AA meeting, and I'm good buds with Cody here. He's one of the best, I'll tell you that. A real beauty, this guy here. He smiles at Cody with what looks like genuine warmth, and Cody smiles back. Martin is clutching a beer and nodding along fervently with Tyler's words. Anyway, thanks for having me in your home. It's a real honor and a privilege. Tyler grins around at everyone. 
And if you'll all do me the favor of joining us for dinner tonight, well, I'd just really appreciate that. Cody's nearest and dearest and all that. Charlie looks like a biker but talks like a used car salesman, all up front, unrelenting charm with a greasy slick to it. The others seem like they're taken in by Tyler's little speech, and there's a general move to finish drinks, gather jackets and purses, and head toward the door, where Tyler stands, keys in hand, staring right at Dawn. She feels herself blush, goddammit, as their eyes meet, but wills herself to hold his gaze for a few seconds. Tyler smiles at her, a slow smile that doesn't reach his eyes, and for a moment Dawn thinks she sees his face flicker, like a bad connection. A shudder, a spasm of pain. Dawn has to look away, and Crystal is suddenly beside her. Crystal angles her small body toward Dawn, who momentarily feels huge and resists their urge to back away, put some distance between them. Crystal leans in and says it must feel so good to have him home. She squeezes Dawn's limp hand between her two soft, hot ones, metallic turquoise nails forming a cage. Yes, it does, Dawn replies, even though she doesn't know what she feels. Too much to parse it all, so much that it nulls out into nothing. That was a great passage. I have some questions about Tyler later. Sure. <laughs> um, so for those of us who um, may have not gotten a chance to read um, the book, did you want to go into a bit of what the book is about and why you picked that particular passage? Sure. So the book follows Dawn, the, the main character, who's returning from her time spent in Toronto back to her prairie hometown, home city, um, and we're not really sure, I'm going to do that, we're not really sure why she's returning home at the start, she's going back to live with her dad, and once she gets there, her brother Cody is released unexpectedly from prison where he was serving time for a violent crime that he committed. Um, so she is sort of set off balance by Cody's arrival, and his, in particular his arrival with Tyler, who as I just read, is this sort of mysterious figure who just appears with Cody uh, and sort of supernatural, mysterious, unsettling things start to unfold from there. And Dawn wonders what Cody's and gotten himself sort of entangled with Tyler. Um, in Writer's Digest, um, an ordinary violence, violence is described as a literary horror. And you really cite your love for horror and desire to read more horror that deals with contemporary indigenous life uh, strong but flawed female characters, and also some of your own experiences. So I'm curious um, how much of that influence combined with all the three really came in through the book, your initial writing process, and if you drew any specific inspiration from characters or specific events. Um, yeah, I mean, I drew, I definitely drew some specific inspiration. Actually, I just wrote a blog post. I don't think it's published yet, but for House of Anansi, um, my publisher, I wrote a blog post about this um, that you'll be able to read shortly if you want to, about the movie Don't Look Now from 1973, Donald Sutherland and uh, Julie Christie. So I talk about um, the inspirations kind of directly from that movie. Um, in the blog post, but more generally, I find I'm inspired by just like things that I find really creepy and unsettling, and I want to sort of interrogate why they're so unsettling to me and why they've creeped me out so much. So I find that really, really interesting. Um, and horror films have inspired me a lot. I've watched a lot of horror films. Um, but yeah, also, yeah, wanting to see not changes because there is a lot of horror that you know delves into social issues and by like underrepresented people. But I guess interrogating some of the classic tropes of horror as a genre. Mm -hmm. No, I think you, you do that very well. There is, um, especially, especially with Dawn, um, you get that sense of uneasiness mm. throughout, especially in the beginning, but really throughout you do a really good job at making you feel the mood that she's in as you're reading. Mm -hmm. um, so you really find yourself immersed in that. Um, with those specific scenes, did you find that there was a certain way you wanted to paint that to make sure that the reader really felt that because I think it was not only just the words that she would use to talk about certain situations but really describing how she was feeling in that moment really seeing her come in and out of herself. Yeah I think I, I did want to capture kind of exactly that um, so I'm glad to hear you say that but just really conveying I think the visceral experience of of what she's experienced of horror of you know confusion of also what it can be like to live in like a modern contemporary colonized society. Um, and I'm just always really interested, I guess, in like the body side, the sensation side, the visceral side of emotions and how that registers in our bodies. 
um, like that's just kind of interesting to me in general. And in particular, I just it's something I think about when I watch the horror movies too. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. what, really, like what does that feel like right mm-hmm. now? You know, when you're like in that situation. Uh, so I think part, yeah, it was it was wanting to to convey that aspect of it as well. Yeah, no, you felt it like again those moments where you could see that she was coming in and out. Mm-hmm. You could really feel just not only with what she was saying, but setting the scene and and her body and her breath, like you could you felt it with her. Thank which you. is really immersive. Um, speaking of um, being in a colonized area and colonization, um, we really see, um, I think, within the first few chapters of the book, um, an instance where she's at the grocery store mm-hmm. and people are, I think, talking about her behind her, literally behind her back, mm-hmm. <laughs> but in, in the line at the mm-hmm. grocery store, um, as long as, as well as elements of gentrification, seeing her go into her um, old neighborhood mm-hmm. and not being the same. I'm also referencing um, missing Indigenous uh, women Mm -hmm. that she seemed to reflect on in the past. So I wanted to know, especially um, you as an Indigenous woman yourself, um, how important it was to incorporate um, those those elements into the story. Yeah, super important. I mean, in some ways that kind of is the story, right? Because that, to me, is like that daily experience or that contemporary experience. you know, however you want to name it, and also showing how, um, just how layered it is, you know, that it's on an individual interpersonal level, but it's also on the systemic and institutional level. So the woman who's talking, who her and her husband make the comment in the grocery store is also a counselor at the school, right? So I wanted to show, like, it's the teachers, you know, it's it can be this sort of casual racism, but also this systematized racism, this institutional racism, and how just, like, uh, prevalent it is, you know, it sort of seeps through every layer of society in a way. So I kind of wanted to get at that feeling. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. Um, and also going and playing on words with the title of the book, An Ordinary Violence. Mm-hmm. So seeing how an ordinary violence shouldn't be ordinary, mm-hmm. but when we're looking at, especially with the Indigenous women that have had multiple cases, but no proper justice and no proper recognition, just seeing how ordinary that's become yes. is so disappointing. Yeah. It's really disappointing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yes, as a reference to that, these violences that should not be ordinary, like you said, for sure, um, and how ordinary and almost like mundane they become in, in some ways. And also to the idea that violence is committed by ordinary people, you know, ordinary people, not monsters. So I think that's something else that sometimes prevents us from like seeing the causes of violence clearly and then addressing them, right, is that we think it's a monster that does it. We think it's not human, and that makes it a not human problem, so that means there's not a human solution to it. But mm-hmm. there can be, when we look at it as like, you know, it actually is human behavior. It's mm-hmm. not, I'm not going to call it normal human behavior, but it's behavior that humans do. Mm-hmm. So we need to kind of see it clearly, I think, to mm-hmm. be able to actually address it properly. Yeah. It's not normal behavior, but it, it's it's beyond maybe a certain type of person. It's maybe yeah. a lot more reachable than what others others may think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And how, yeah, you know, how thin that line can be at times. Not that we're all like, a, you know, dying to slip away from violence or anything like that, but I think sometimes we imagine that it takes a very special kind of person when often what it takes is kind of very special circumstances that mm-hmm. create, um, you know, create those opportunities to make those choices and then some people make those choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it all comes down to a choice. Yeah, yeah, and that is, and that as well, yeah. Um, just going back to, again, the very beginning of the book. So as you mentioned, um, Dawn is returning to her hometown after being um, in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, at first, we believe, or mostly believe at the beginning that she's there to go see her dad. Um, we later on kind of get a, a backstory as to the events that took place yeah. um, beforehand. Um, I found that part particularly interesting because you really see Dawn's excitement um, moving to Toronto, mm-hmm. a new job, a new relationship, um, starting this whole new life. And I think a lot of people can relate to that in the sense of whether something's going bad or there's a, a change of some kind really coming to a new place mm-hmm. and starting fresh mm-hmm. and thinking that, things can be different or you're really running away from your your problems, for lack of a better word. But um, you see, again, she definitely has certain circumstances, but um, you really see that that fresh start isn't really attainable. Mm -hmm. So you really feel um, 
how let down she is to, again, not have that work out, but then go back to a place that she really has no interest in returning to. Yeah. So yeah. that was really interesting, again, to see. I think that's that's a relatable thing in the sense of you think that you can leave your hometown and kind of have this new start, which mm-hmm. is still very much true. But yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to maybe branching out and it not being the experience that they hoped it would be. Yeah, I, I hope so, and I think so. And yeah, it is that. You know, like it is it is true in some ways, like you said. Like you are, you will be changed by the experience, like you're changed by any experience. And I think most of the time you're, it'll be, there'll be positive elements, of, you know, some kind of growth or something, perspective shift. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not going to be this like glorious, you know, the clouds part and the sun comes out moment, which I think a lot of people, especially if they're unhappy in their, you know, their hometowns or whatever, wherever they're living, uh, think it might be. It still kind of has that like allure to it. Um, so yeah, just kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so we see her again return to her hometown, um, and you see the distant relationship with her father. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I wanted, like, a lot of the relationships, especially the close relationships in the book, there's, like, a lot of silence between them. So I was just exploring that concept on that interpersonal level, but also the societal level, you know. Um, there's just a lot of silence in this country in general. Um, you think about the graves at the residential schools when they started being... Um, discovered, you know, I can't count how many people went, well, we never knew about this. Well, you know, well, we never we never learned about this. We never got taught about this. And, like, okay, maybe there was some validity to that, that it wasn't on, you know, your public school curriculum, but the information was undoubtedly out there, right? It had been out there for a very long time. So with, like, minimal effort, people probably could have found it. So things like that, you know, there's a silence. There's a, we don't want to talk about it. Um, or we'll talk about it for a bit, and then we'll kind of just let it fade. And then if you bring it up again... That's bad. Um, you know, we've had two truth and reconciliation reports in this country, one in 1996 that my, one of my paternal uncles worked on, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which was a truth and reconciliation report. Actually, a lot of the recommendations are quite similar, and some of the challenges and issues are exactly the same, which is quite interesting uh, to the 2017 report. So, um, yeah, just lots of silences around... Um, around Indigenous people and Indigenous issues in this country, and then a lot of, like, interpersonal silences, too, and a lot of Native families and between a lot of Native people because, uh, you know, real trauma, I find, creates silence first, it's, and that's, I think, pretty universal, and it takes a long time to be able to speak about it, to be able to speak it truthfully, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think a lot of Native people are still in that, that, silent, that traumatic silence as well and finding it hard to break out of that, so mm-hmm. also addressing that. Yeah. For sure. And and I think right, again, the very beginning, you, you see the father, it seems that he kind of takes on more of a hermit. He's usually on his couch watching TV. Um, you can you can tell that there is there is somewhat of that dynamic there between him and Dawn, but you can really feel the, the strain as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think, and also Dawn, I think, feels... Um, justly that he hasn't been like the greatest father in terms of actually fathering them, especially when it comes to Cody and just sort of, I think, mm-hmm. um, abdicating in her eyes a bit of his fatherly responsibilities and kind of letting Cody go go off on a bad path. Yeah, for sure. Um, which actually goes to my next question. Um, so you see, again, very um, big ups and downs with, with Cody and mm-hmm. Don. Um, what did you want readers to get out of there? relationship. There's really so much. You see, again, the flashbacks that they have as kids um, to Cody being released from prison and, again, having that disconnect because Dawn wasn't there, but also seeing, again, why she felt... So there, there's really there's a, a lot of history there, um, and you, you see them try to coexist in this new space now that she's back home and he's released. Um, so what did you want readers to get out of their relationship? I don't know if I can like prescribe something to get out of it, but I think I I was really interested in exploring like what happens when someone you love and someone who's really close to you does something like really bad, like really terrible, like something really um, disruptively terrible, like murdering someone. Um, you know, how does that, what are the ripple effects of that violence and what are the ripple effects that led up to that violence in the first place? So kind of looking at that whole thing as almost like, circle or a web 
of like interconnected events and meanings in a way, while there is still, at the end of the day, the ultimate choice was Cody's to do what he did, right? So looking at just kind of parsing out, I think, all of those sort of complicated questions through their their two characters and through their relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you, you see, again, um, you see Don caring, and, and you see, I think, how hard it is to accept that certain things have happened. Um, it was also really heartbreaking the scene. Um, I believe they met at their local mall, I think, in the food court yes. as well. And he was basically kind of telling her to to go. To, yeah. um, so that was also tough too, because again, you could see that she was already in such a such a state herself, yeah. not wanting to be there, but being there. Yeah. So to have her brother basically tell her to go, and that you know we don't we don't need you here yeah. anymore. That was that was as a reader definitely yeah. tough to. And and I could just I think see the, the winding of the past kind of forward in that conversation. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I see that conversation as Cody's actually trying to save her. He's trying to get her out before whatever goes down goes down, mm-hmm. but he's, you know, he can't communicate it very yeah. well. And Dawn perceives it as, you know, him tr- him just trying to cast her off again, trying yeah. to kind of abandon her again yeah. so she doesn't go. Yeah. Again, later on later on we see, but in that, yeah. in that moment it's, it's not for certain. Um, so with Cody um, as well, we really never, we rarely see him um, not accompanied with without Tyler. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, Tyler, I don't, I don't care for that much. <laughs> um, did, Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tyler, Tyler. Mm. Um, did you know as a character that he would be a pivotal person in that in your novel, or was he someone that kind of just came about throughout writing? Yeah, I think I did know, like, I had a vague sense of him as this figure in the novel and sort of what he would represent that became, like, much more defined and clearer um, as I wrote. But, yeah, I did I did feel that he was going to definitely play um, a pivotal role. And I think a lot of the things that I kind of explored through that character, I definitely wanted to, to be in the book. Yeah, yeah. You really see him as... as I don't want to call him the instigator, but you really see him... As soon as, as Cody gets out, they're basically two peas in a pod. Mm. You don't see one without the other. Um, and you really can sense, even Dawn is sensing, like, this is not good vibes. This is not mm. good. Um, yeah, he just, I didn't like. But I liked, re- I liked reading about him. I didn't like him. <laughs> I liked reading about him. Um, no, he was a really interesting character. Um, Tyler, as well as all the other characters, you managed to actually find a moment for majority of them to have a flash, many flashbacks, mm-hmm. more specifically with Dawn and her family, but um, Tyler as well. Uh, how important was it for you to really incorporate those flashbacks? Just because I really think as a reader, it helps you understand the character a lot more, really understanding who they are and why they do what they do and really get into their psyche. So, Yeah, it was, it was really important for me. Um, for sure. So I wrote that chapter kind of like later on, and it is, and it comes later on in the book. And I didn't kind of realize that it was like this weird sort of like perspective shift. My editor was like, "It's kind of weird, but it works. Like we'll we'll do it." But I I felt like I needed to do it to explain who Tyler was, like not a neat kind of like one to one explanation, you know, but to give the circumstances of who he was, like sort of, um, you know, not an origin story, but just that background, you know, I felt it was important for Cody as well as Tyler, um, for all the people that sort of do bad things, you know, I thought that that was, that was an important thing to look at. Mm-hmm. Because again, it's, it's, it goes back to choices are made. Yeah. You have a choice. Yes. But again, digging deeper into why those choices were made based yes. on their experiences. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Again, a lot, lot of choices, a lot of interesting choices are made in this book. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> um, so as well, there's also a strong supernatural and spiritual foundation in the book. Um, from Dawn seeing animals, such as the rabbit, um, she also encounters her deceased mother, uh, Violet, uh, throughout the book quite a lot. Um, and again, like, you really see the effects of that in trying to understand what's happening, play more into her feeling. Um, this kind of dread and, and unease. Um, so, 
I guess I wanted to know, again, the inspiration behind that as well, if there were, again, specific elements you wanted to incorporate at certain times. Um, but yeah, I think the sort of, like, general landscape of how the supernatural, like, interacts, it, it comes from, like, an, I'll say an indigenous worldview, only because I mean that a lot of different indigenous nations have a very similar sort of worldview around um, spiritual things, and that is almost viewed as natural and the interactions with them, people kind of accept that that's a thing that can happen and things like that. So that sort of general atmosphere, I think, came from a lot of that. Um, the rabbit itself, like the form of the rabbit actually came from a dream I had like a long time ago when I was a teenager um, that I was just like walking and I looked down this alley and there was a, like a massive jackrabbit at the end of this alley, just like way oversized and I wasn't doing anything. I was like sitting there, but it had this like sense of menace like emanating off it and it was like weird. Um, and that always stuck with me. And then I thought, why don't I make this this thing, yeah. whatever it may be, into this giant jackrabbit and see if I can make it creepy. So wow. That, yeah, that was that one. Yeah, yeah. it was not as creepy, <laughs> but it was, it was interesting. Did you ever see the rabbit again, or was it only that one time? That no, that was a dream. I never, that was a I dream. Seen it in real life. So, okay, okay. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've seen big-ass jackrabbits. Like, if you go <laughs> to, like, Manitoba, like, they're big. They're kind of creepy in a way, like, even just, like, the regular normal ones, because they are just, like, these super-sized rabbits, and they're, like, really powerful back legs. And, like, when you're used to thinking about a rabbit as, like, a tiny little fluffy pet guy, you see them, you're like, whoa. Um, so, it, yeah, it, only the one time in the dream. And okay. never, never in real life. Dream. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. I'm surprised even writing it that it that the rabbit didn't come back to you yeah. either. But again, yeah. it's, it's come yeah. back in fruition in exactly. other ways. Yeah. So, wonderful. Um, can you see yourself um, continuing Dawn's story at all? So I know, again, I want to keep it as spoiler-free as possible, um, but I, I would say that there could be a possibility based on how it ended, but I'm curious um, if that would be a possibility for you. Yeah, I think it could be a possibility. Like, I, I would say I'm open to it. I'm not, like, actively planning it or working on it currently, but I could possibly be open to it, like, somewhere, somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll see. That's promising. <laughs> um, so your education and background spans with film studies as well as uh, social work. Um, how do, did you find the process, as this is your first novel, um, one or both of those areas of work may be influencing uh, this novel? I mean, both for sure. Um, I think, you know, working in social work and knowing people in circumstances, like tough circumstances and things like that, you just, like, understand, I think, or you learn how to be, like, more sensitive to things like that and to see things like the root causes of it or, you know, the circumstances that led up to it and just to have a more fuller perspective of some of those things. So social work for sure um, helps with that. And in the cinema studies, I think the way I write is that I picture like a scene first, like I get an image and then I start like writing that image or describing that image and then it kind of builds from there. So it might just be like, anything, a character's having dinner with their boyfriend or something, and I write that, and then I'll even kind of, like, that person might become the main character. I don't know. I kind of have to find the story. Mm -hmm. So, but I initially write through kind of envisioning these images, I guess, and then mm -hmm. describing them. So I think that's probably um, part of, partly from cinema studies, you know, because you read a film, you can read a film much the way you can read a book, just different language. So I think probably it influences it quite heavily, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking again of just your background in film, I'm I'm sure I'm not the first to ask this, but I'm sure a lot of people probably picked at if this was ever made into a film of some of of any kind. I'm sure that would be something that you would you would only be heavily involved in, but I'm sure it would be even more perfect just with your background itself, be able to only bring your own work to life, but have this other lens. Um, in film as well to really bring a, a very unique approach, if, if that were to happen? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely be interested in it at some point. I work in film right now, um, so it would not be anything immediate, but yeah, I mean, the idea is definitely appealing to me uh, in the future, for sure. Um, so, going back again to before the book, the very kind of square one, um, you previously noted that you actually started um, writing the book, or I guess kind of picking out ideas during the start of the uh, pandemic. So I'm curious, um, since that was such a unique time, uh, what your writing schedule was like, and if, if 
felt that that time um, being in kind of lockdown uh, worked in your favor at all? It definitely worked in my favor because I, I just had a bunch of time on my hands. Like, I, like I'm a pretty social person. I'd go out with friends like quite often or out to events and, you know, probably four or five nights a week, and then all of a sudden it was like, nope, and you're, and you're not even going into your office. I was like, oh, dear, um, I need to do something. So I started writing to, like, occupy myself, and then I found that the story um, was just kind of flowing from there. So I just kept writing it. So, yeah. Is there specific times of day that you worked on? Did you feel that um, you would kind of come up with an idea, kind of drop things down, take breaks? Is there a specific routine that you were in, or <laughs> kind of whenever, whenever you felt like it? Like, yeah, I don't think I have a specific routine for, like, anything in my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> My mom can attest to. But, uh, yeah, no, very chaotic uh, just when I kind of feel it. And, like, sometimes I'll force myself and be like, sit down and, and start doing some stuff. But often when I feel like it, yeah, I, I can't stick, stick to a schedule really, and that actually prevented me from starting to write for a long time. So a lot of the advice you read online is like, how to be a writer. They're like, write every day, write at the same time every day, write for exactly 12 minutes, you know, whatever, like all this like structured advice. So I was like, oh man, I'll never, I'll never write anything. That's, if that's how you do it, you know, I'll never be able to do it. Um, and then when the lockdown came and, you know, all social norms and everything went out the window, I was like, whatever, just start writing. Um, so yeah. no, no schedule. Okay, but, that's good. <laughs> but if it worked for you, it worked for you. Like I'm yeah. not hating on it. I just like personally can't, cannot do a routine for writing. Yeah. I think again, it's not a universal thing. Yeah. It's the writer, the art and, and how that, that transcends ultimately. Um, yeah. Again, I was going to ask as this is your first novel. So we see now that in terms of the schedule, it was very much <laughs> your own thing. Yes. Um, approaching this from, for the very first time, um, were there any, anything that surprised you about the experience as a whole? writing and, and publishing for the first time? Yeah, I mean, writing the book was just surprising. Like, I, like when, I, when I say, like, it just kept coming, like, I was like, oh, I just have more ideas for it. Like, that was, like, a new phenomenon. Like, I'd only written, like, short stories or even just bits of short stories before. So, yeah, it was just surprising that I found that I could, like, actually continue the story myself, like, think of more things of where it should go and who the characters were. I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, so overall, what kind of conversations are you hoping to spark uh, with your book? Are there any particular insights that you really aim uh, to share with those who are, are, are reading or will read? I think I just want something to stick, like whatever it may be for each reader, just anything that resonates with them, whether it's like a perspective or an image or you know a sentence or a character. I think if something resonates with you after you read something in any way, then that's to win. So I hope that something just someone comes away with something from it, whatever that mm -hmm. might be. <laughs> yeah. So again, I can I can say say myself as well. Um, it was definitely different than what I'm I'm used to reading, but it was it was it was pleasant. I found that. Um, so I know you were saying your love for horror. Me personally, it's. It's hard for me. I get very, I get scared by like Pennywise the Clown yes, <laughs> very easily. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I felt that um, you, you still felt that unsettlingness, which was new mm. to me, but also that care for Dawn, just wanting to see her through it, and also be um, enlightened with, you know, just the indigenous life, her relationship with her family. Like, there was definitely a lot to, to soak up in more ways than one. So. Thank you. Yeah, there's, I'm sure, again, people will, would feel the same, if not more, reading the book for, for the first time. So, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you are working on now, and will you approach that body of work similar to an ordinary violence? Yes, I'm, I'm working on something. It's not super far along, but working on it, a novel, and it will be like similar, I guess, themes, not not the same characters or story or anything like that, but yeah, similar, addressing similar themes for sure. Okay. okay, we're looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, so I believe we have a question from the yeah. chat. So I'm going to talk about that for me. But I have a question, which is that uh, I read the uh, novel and like the very beginning, I was really struck by the fact that it was like a Not in that they didn't have death, but in like a, well, like I felt like I could get to know this person as a person, mm. um, and I really 
was wondering how you approach building these characters or how you approach like creating them and then maybe like the relationship that they had and who came first or like how that works. And then before you answer, again, if anyone also has a question, feel free to, to raise your hand at, at any time as well in the chat, um, anytime. Sorry. Sure. Um, I think I think Dawn came first when I think back on it, but Cody was like pretty close behind her. And I think I really built a lot of them off like that interplay between them, like how they would both interact in, in the situation or the circumstance. Um, and then like dialogue, I like listening to how people actually talk in real life um, and observing like their, how they speak in, in real life. So I find dialogue's important to me. Uh, and then just like little details, like uh, sometimes I'll take like a trait from one of my friends and like the characters, like not based off them at all, but I'll just steal a physical trait or, you know, a quirk of their personality and add it in there to, you know, give them some more detail. So things like that. And then once you start putting them into the story, you start to get more of a feel for them and you start to like feel that you know how they would respond to this or what makes the most sense for them to, to respond to something. And, yeah. Um, other characters I actually didn't get a chance to ask about um, Crystal. Yes. So Crystal and, and Jake. So we see Crystal um, and Dawn also again reconnect. Um, and also it's, I think, very relatable. It's when you have that friend or maybe best friend that you were, you're really close to and then there's distance for, for whatever reason and they come back and you can, you can really sense that it's just awkward. <laughs> like it's just very <laughs> awkward. I think Crystal is very happy. To see Dawn. Um, I think Dawn is from the, the looks of it kind of just going with it. Yeah. But you could you could sense like it was very relatable when maybe there's someone that you used to know mm -hmm. and it's kind of like running into them again and being like, Oh yeah, like we yeah, we have memories, you go back, but it's just it's not the same anymore. So it was interesting yeah. to see them reconnect in the beginning and then kind of towards the end really also again continue to see that divide as well. So it's yeah. an interesting uh, friendship that we got to see play out too, or, or mm -hmm. I don't know. Would you would you say would you say that during the book that they were friends at that time, or did you do you think that that was also kind of a weird fuzzy spot? I think it's I think it's like a weird spot. Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't say they're exactly friends, but just like you said, they're in that space where they have had known each other and had known each other very closely. You know, had had a very intimate friendship. Um, but now they've made, you know, different choices, done different things with their lives, and now I think they've sort of landed in these different places where they just find it hard to communicate. Um, you know, Crystal's got a little kid, she's been married to Jake, who we find out is, you know, maybe not the greatest guy. Um, so I think just sort of playing with that idea, you know, like what, how much do we change as a person in, you know, seven years? How much do we change when we make certain choices? And like, how that can also be sort of put into relief when you haven't seen someone for a long time. You know, you've sort of, each person can kind of see the other person, I think, even more clearly they can see themselves sometimes. For sure, for sure. And again, all, all time has gone by and I'm sure they've, they've grown respectively apart. So coming together in the certain, certain circumstances. Um, it is also interesting too, because throughout the book, we see Crystal and Jake with Cody and Tyler a lot more. So mm -hmm. you see, you see, I think, Crystal following her husband, but also still kind of, I think, attempting to, to make nice with Dawn as well. But then, again, we see we see Jake, who actually might, I might dislike Jake more than Tyler. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, it might be how I feel. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's different, different levels. Yeah. Um, but we see her, again, kind of have this loyalty to her husband and what yeah. Jake wants to do um, as well. So I, I think maybe she's kind of trying to be kind of, you know, lack of a better term, neutral. Yes. But it, again, yeah. maybe it's not, yeah. at least with Dawn, not really sticking. Yeah, and I think maybe she's trying to, I mean, I think she's, get, she's getting out of the house for one thing. You know, she, I think she just wants to be out of her house at, mm -hmm. in the evenings at points, but also trying to maybe get back some normality that she's lost or maybe she's not sure if she wants to get back that normality that she's losing or not mm -hmm. and she's kind of in that weird space too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, again, it breaks my heart because I, I felt like throughout the book you really see her struggle mm -hmm. with that normality. Um, 
I guess, I guess again, right away, did you, did you know that Dawn was going to be who you had in that book, or did you find that she kind of came to life more and more, and there were certain, again, kind of feelings that you wanted to invoke the more that she came to life on paper? Yeah, she, def she definitely came to life more and more as I wrote and developed more as I wrote, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's, you know, again, my, my heart breaks, but I, I do think that you, you see how much she endures. Yeah. And, and the strength that uh, she has throughout that. Next question, please. Yes. Yeah. My question is um, about this book. Sometimes it is real, sometimes it's unreal, such as the referee, that's terrible. So, we, we, uh, because you want to write this book, so maybe you will immerse into this story, personal role. So, after the real work, will he have any difficulty to identify now is a real and now is not a real work? <laughs> I hope not. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Um, but I like that you said that because that was exactly the feeling that I wanted to get in the book. Like I wanted everyone to feel that Dawn was experiencing that sense of, of unreality or, or um, Sort of being in and out of different different planes, I guess. Um, so I'm I'm glad that that came through clearly. Well, so it won't come through. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, like uh, sometimes we have a dream, right? Yeah. Sometimes you will think it's a dream. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think we had a question in the chat. Yeah. So this question then um, it is: uh, Can you say a few words? Uh, what was it like to get your book published or the publishing experience as a whole? I'll just repeat that for everyone at home. So um, if you can say a few words for the process of getting published for the first time. Sure. Um, so I wrote like a version of the manuscript, like I, like start to finish. And then I submitted that to the House of Anansi, my publisher's open call. They do an open call like twice a year, I think, February and and summer. Uh, so I submitted in February, and I didn't expect really much because they kind of tell you, like, when you submit it, like, don't expect much. Um, we got a lot of submissions, so um, I just kind of did it and hoped for the best. And then they they bought it. So Shira Rose Lewinsky, who's my editor um, at Host of Anansi, bought it from that, from there, and then, yeah, started working on it with her, edited it for about a year, I want to say. And a lot of that was, like, putting it into chapters because um, I didn't write it with, like, chapters originally and sort of structuring it and adding, you know, enhancing stuff and adding stuff. Um, yeah, so it was pretty cool. They were originally actually going to publish it in like January 2024 and then they bumped it up to um, the fall. So like the last edit was kind of like this like frenzy in November. Um, it was cool. Yeah, it was really great. I loved the editing process actually. I give notes to people on scripts like all the time in my uh, job and I loved being on the other side of it, like getting creative notes and, um, you know, hearing people's questions about it and getting to think about my work that way. So I really enjoyed it. I, I had a pretty great experience um, personally. Yeah. Do you have any advice uh, for first time writers who are maybe in your shoes? I, I think just again, what to expect, any words of wisdom that you've, you've obtained throughout this? Yeah, I mean, just apply for stuff. Like, there's, you know, labs and, like, writing workshops and stuff like that for emerging people. I I did, like, at the BAMP, I think, Emerging Writers Workshop or something as well with, like, a portion of this manuscript. I got into that. Um, so things like that are great, just to, like, network and meet people. And then I really just did internet research, like, looked who, you know, I'm, like, doing, like, how do you get a book published? Um, like, how do you query an agent? Like, stuff like that. And there's a bunch of articles that you can read that will tell you what to do and researching literary agents, the agencies, what they specialize in, what they're looking for, um, you know, knowing who publishes, the kind of thing you want to publish, where you live, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, just a lot of Googling, really, and then applying for stuff. <laughs> okay. okay, good to know, good to know. Um, so I'll just take the questions first yet. Do you have one question? Yeah, all the books, uh, they just sound the name of the style seems you. Yeah, it's a bit, I mean, it's an amalgamation of several different areas. I grew up in St. Norbert in Winnipeg, so there are some places that are like kind of real places in St. Norbert, but it is a bit of, it's a fictional, it's an amalgamation of a bunch of places, yeah. 
Um, and I believe we have one more question from the chat, and yeah, I'll repeat so it. Another chat question. Do you have a favorite Canadian author? Do you have a favorite Canadian author? I think I would have to say Dion Brand. Um, what We All Long For is one of my favorite novels of all time, and I think a lot of Canadian writers feel that way, that she writes about you know, black, brown, marginalized people, characters with so much detail and humanity and makes those contemporary lives so interesting and poetic. I think that's probably one of the first times I experienced that, especially in a Canadian context, was through her work in that novel. So probably John Brandt. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I think you just come back in. But um, does the title have any significance or like, why did you choose this person? So the, does the title have any significance, and uh, why did you choose the particular title? Yeah, my editor suggested it, um, and I was like, great, and I liked it. I think it was ordinary violence at first, and then I wanted the Anne in it because I felt like that spoke to the different levels of it and the different ways that it plays out, that it's not just like one form of violence or one act of violence, that it's like there's all these different things that can happen. So. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, we chatted about it a bit, just this idea of how normalized a lot of violence has been um, in, in Indigenous communities and outside of them to against Indigenous people and between Indigenous people, um, looking at, you know, those, those issues and those circumstances, and then also looking at, you know, how, how it is people who commit violence at the end of the day. It is a human choice and a human act and, and just being able to see that clear-eyed. Anyone have any questions? Um, I'm just wondering with your film background and your love of horror movies, if the book got brought to film, was there anyone you like really want working on it? Whether it's like directors, um, <laughs> <laughs> or, like, actors, or just like even the vibe of it. Um, I mean, I can't. I I, I won't say anyone Canadian just because I work at our <laughs> film funder, um, and I'll get in trouble. But uh, actually, I don't know. No one's asked me that before, so I haven't really thought of it. Um, I don't know who who I'd want to, to do it. Maybe Sterling Harjo. <laughs> he did Reservation Dogs. Yeah. 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 I'll say Sterling. <laughs> He's not Canadian. <laughs> Yeah, I always wanted to. Like, it was a, definitely a dream and, and a huge realization of a dream. Uh, but my writing was just really, like, not not really organized. Like, I would start a short story and then maybe finish it, maybe not. And I'd have all these little pieces of writing. Um, and then I was in film school for a long time, so I wrote a bunch of essays. So I've always loved writing and reading. I read a lot. Um, and, yeah, definitely a dream. So I always wanted to do it, but I wasn't sure what the path would be. Be to do it <laughs> until I started doing it, I guess. And then you kept all those papers and then you gave it to your editor. Is that what you did? Like, what are the papers that you wrote down that here there? You just Oh, no, I wrote it on the computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all, and it was all in work document. But I do actually have notes, like, scattered all over my apartment. Like, I would jot down an idea on, like, a random piece of paper and then have to go find that piece of paper after. <laughs> like, oh, it was on the back of that bill that I wrote it on. <laughs> Again, whatever whatever works through your process. Yeah. If that's yeah. if that's what came of this, then I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any other questions here in the audience before we're wrapping up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll repeat that. So, do authors have any say um, with uh, the cover of the book? Yeah, designing it. Designing. Uh, I also have a kind of question. Uh, for the insertion question, could we repeat it uh, to what you repeated it? Uh, so that the yeah, for sure. So, um, again, just to repeat that, um, do you have any say in the design of uh, the cover of the book? I did personally like they asked me sort of for my like general ideas of what I might like and I kind of gave them that and then um, actually I don't even I don't even know if what they came back with was necessarily from that but they came back with a couple of options 
Um, and I've just loved, and the, the rabbit one was one of them, and I loved it, like, right away. I was like, they nailed it. I thought they did a really great job just of, like, capturing the vibes of the book and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, like, I had approval over it and, and everything like that, but it was really um, their, I think their art designer who, who took that and, and did that, and it was great, yeah. Okay. Okay. So if there aren't... Oh, well, There's one more. Yeah. This is, um, I think mean, as the book is kind of like, uh, like has an indigenous woman as a main character, uh, are the staff person asked, like, are you involved in different things communities? Um, because that would play into how you wrote the, the character. And so forth. Okay, so to repeat the question, um, are you involved in any First Nations communities as like, the story centers around an indigenous woman? I mean, I am Indigenous. My dad, my dad's a Native person who's right over Métis. Um, my mom's white, so yes, I'm, I'm an Indigenous person, so obviously it draws from, from that. But I also have, obviously, Indigenous family, friends. I worked at um, the world's largest Indigenous film festival, Imagine Native, for many years. Um, so I've worked with a lot of different Indigenous communities in terms of film and training and development uh, in Canada as well as internationally. So, um, yes, I'm not sure if that's really the question, but yes. <laughs> um, so we are four minutes to eight. So if there aren't any other questions, um, I think we are okay to wrap up. Um, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Adriana, for um, gracing us with your presence. Um, it was just such a wonderful book. I was so happy to read, so hopefully um, everyone else can get their hands on a book soon. Um, we actually have a whole, a wait list on the book here from Mississauga Library oh, great. as well. <laughs> um, so it is, it is in need for sure. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for coming, and thank you all for coming uh, virtually and in person. Um, if you have any questions about the library and wanting to um, get the book, you can just uh, search it up on our catalog uh, at our library website. And any programs such as these will also be listed um, on our website as well. So thank you again. Thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.